I shared the idea that James and John in the Gospel of Mark are a redo of Castor and Pollux. But the re-expression of Greek literature in terms of the Old Testament is far more extensive. In fact, the use of Greek literature as a model for re-expressing others' mythology and politics was the main intellectual activity of the Hellenistic world. I didn't want to include a lot of this material because I hadn't read the second and third of Dennis R. MacDonald's books. I still haven't. But I have read parts 1 and 2 of his Luke and Virgil. Looks to me that part 3 and his third book about the Gospel of John being a redo of Dionysus is just more details. So, without further ado. Proofs that learning language, and how to do poetry is by studying Greek mythology, for history has a certain affinity to poetry and may be regarded as a kind of prose poem, while it is written for the purpose of narrative, not of proof, and designed from beginning to end not for immediate effect or the instant necessities of forensic strife, but to record events for the benefit of posterity and to win glory for its author. Quintilian, Institutio Oratoria, 10.1.31 inches for there can be no doubt that in art no small portion of our task lies in imitation, since, although invention came first and is all important, it is expedient to imitate whatever has been invented with success. 2. And it is a universal rule of life that we should wish to copy what we approve in others. Quintilian, Institutio Oratoria, 10.2.1606e, then, Glaucon, said I, when you meet encomiasts of Homer who tell us that this poet has been the educator of Hellas, one and that for the conduct and refinement too of human life he is worthy of our study and devotion, and that we should order our entire lives by the guidance of this poet, Plato, Republic 10.606e1 Isocrates, Panager, 159, says Homer was given a place in education because he celebrated celebrated those who fought against the barbarians. Pages three-quarters of Dennis R. MacDonald's The Homeric Epics and the Gospel of Mark gives a good summary of the parallels between Jesus and Odysseus in the Gospel of Mark. Both are carpenters. They both sail seas with inferiors. Both return home with rivals. Both oppose supernatural foes. Both visit dead heroes, prophesy their return from the dead. A wise woman anoints both. Both eat last suppers. Both still waters and walk on water. Both make meals for thousands. Both confront monsters at caves. The Gospel of Mark's Peter appears to be Homer's Eurylochus, who complains that the crew cannot continue in the open sea. Eurylochus thought that a god was planning evil because Odysseus was not taking pity on the crew. Jesus says a famous parallel to this get behind me Satan, because you're setting your mind not on divine things but human things. Mar 833. Odysseus comes disguised as a beggar. Jesus tells Jews to not tell who he is. But he doesn't tell Gentiles to keep quiet. More proof Jesus is a pro-Roman sun god. Both Odysseus and Jesus preach on a boat, while everyone else stands on the shore. Jesus preaching on a boat while everyone else stands on the shore can only be explained by that fact that the Gospel of Mark writer must be taking from Homer's Odyssey. In Homer's Odyssey chapter 10, a Circe turns Odysseus's men into swine. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 5 verses 1 to 20, Jesus sent 2,000 men into the sea to drown, just as Circe turns the swine back into men. Later they all drown in the sea. Odyssey 9 to 3 says nobody is my name. Mark chapter 5 verse 9 says legion is my name. There's a parallel between Odyssey's Tiresias and Mark's Bartimaeus. A Clement of Alexandria quote proves it come to me, old man, you too. Leaving Thebes and throwing away your prophesy and Bacchic revelry. Be led by the hand of truth. Look, I give you the wood of the cross to lean on. Hurry Tiersha's believe, you will see, Christ, through whom the eyes of the blind recover their sight, shine more brightly than the sun. Night will flee you, fire will fear you, death will leave you, though you cannot now see Thebes, old man, you will see heaven. Jesus is anointed by a woman who achieves far-flung glory. Far-flung glory in Greek is Eurycleia. Odysseus is recognized first by an Eurycleia, who is anointing him. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 16 verse 5, upon opening the tomb of Jesus, they see a young man. Dennis MacDonald shows this is the same character as in Mark chapter 14 verse 51 where a naked youth runs away. The Homer parallel is an Elpenor, the youngest of his crew. The other canonical Gospels reverse much of this. For instance, the twelve followers are not made to be cowards for apostolic reputations, reasons. 
Like the Christian churches that sit on pagan tombs and temples, to replace them, the Christians who used Greek literature to frame their mythology did so to userp the Greeks. They want to get away from mathematical truth and have their spiritual truth. We see this even more in the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And really, like Socrates who argued to mythologize, because surely the Homeric epics cannot be true, the Christians thought they were going from mythos to logos, and in the Gospel of John saying Jesus is the logos, the word of God. We'll see Socrates Christianized in the book of Acts, but first, we'll see that the Gospel of Luke is a Christianizing of Euripides. Dennis R. MacDonald identifies four main areas of Luke, Acts, Jesus at Jericho, Peter's Pentecost, Saul's role as a Theomachos, Paul as a Dionysus I highlight Zacchaeus in the Jesus at Jericho scenes. Zacchaeus is a redo of Lazarus in the Gospel of John. While Luke likely modeled his story after Mark's, Dennis R. MacDonald shows the parallels to Euripides' Dionysus. One of the major parallels between the Dionysus and Zacchaeus stories is climbing a tree. When looking at Dennis R. MacDonald's side-by-side -side columns of Jesus at Jericho, the Menads are mentioned. Dennis R. MacDonald mentions much about the Menads, but doesn't see the Greek triple goddesses. He mentions divine madness, but doesn't relate this to Hercules' divine madness or the slaughter of the innocents. He doesn't consider the Euripides' Bacchae as the male gods replacing the female goddesses. But, in his second main parallel, Peter's Pentecost, he shows some interesting new mythology of the Menads and goddesses. Luke changes the women who go to see Jesus' tomb from Salome, and other women to Joanna and Susanna. They are also mentioned in Luke chapter 8 verses 1 to 3. Who are Joanna and Susanna? The suggestion is they are Menads. Joanna is Anna, or Hannah. Hannah is Samuel's mother in 1 Samuel 2 in the Old Testament. Hannah is accustomed to being drunk while participating in religious rites, a property of Bacchae Menads. Susanna takes some linguistics. See Dennis R. MacDonald's, Luke and Virgil page 24 for that. Acts chapter 16 verses 13 to 14, 13 on the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. 14 One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Here we see a woman from Lydia, and she wore purple cloth. These are the properties of Dionysus. Dionysus is from Lydia and turns water to wine, purple color. The suggestion is she's a Christianized menad. 